it's 11.30 on the dot here, so I will be getting started. If you came to listen to a talk about IoT and OT scanning, you're in the right place. The title looks a little different from what you see on the schedule. It's the same content. I just really wanted a cool picture to start with, so I changed the, the title of the talk. So good, it's still morning. So good morning, everybody. My name is Huxley Barbie. I am the security evangelist at Run Zero. You might know us from our previous name, Rumble Network Discovery. Everything that I speak here is my own opinions, not those of my company, but that's uh, just so happens to be where I work. I am also the lead organizer for B-Size New York City, so I, um, I'm very happy that I was accepted to come speak here because I don't get to speak my, at my own conference. I have to fly around to, to, to be able to um, share my own ideas. If you want to connect with me, uh, those are the links down there. So when we think of compute, our minds often go to laptops and servers and databases, and these are what we call IT devices. But this only represents a very small percentage of chips that are manufactured. In fact, I saw a statistic the other day that says that 90% of chips go into embedded devices. Some of these embedded devices are IoT devices, which range in a huge, huge variety. We often like to joke that these days even coffee mugs and lava lamps are on the network somehow. But IoT devices also include run-of-the-mill stuff like your printers, home automation like your doorbells, power supplies, as well as IP cameras. And some other of these embedded devices are what we call OT devices, operational technology devices that operate our factories, our oil refineries, our gas pipelines, and um, water treatment plants, and all sorts of areas that our government considers to be critical infrastructure and key resources. So two points of clarification here. Throughout this talk, I'm going to use the term OT as a synonym for ICS, industrial control systems. So if you hear me say OT, you can also automatically translate to ICS if you like. And the second one here is that you'll notice I have a medical device. Medical devices are often called IOMT, Internet of Medical Things. So you might think it falls into the IoT bucket. Many of us would think that. But due to the way they are used, their usage patterns and their roles and how long they are kept uh, in operations, IOMT devices, medical devices, look a lot more like OT devices. And so they're in the OT bucket, right? In this talk, obviously, we're going to focus on IoT and OT. Most of us are not familiar with OT, right? If you're like me, you started out in IT. And so I'm going to go over what that is first. Then we'll talk about how it's a very easy challenge for offense to compromise our OT environments. Then I'll briefly talk about what people are doing right now in terms of defensive scanning. And then I'll talk about the novel idea of this talk, which is you know, actively scanning in, in OT environments. And then finally, we'll jump over and talk about IoT. So even though many of our OT environments are considered critical infrastructure and key resources, they are shockingly unprotected. But when I say OT device, what do I really mean? So let's have a look. There's a huge, huge variety in OT environments. So it's not like IT where um, people have stock PCs and Macs and all the, the parts are sort of modular, um, you have modular components. So rather, there are a lot of devices out there that are specially designed for specific purposes. And so a particular OT device in an electro electrical plant would look very different than an OT device in a manufacturing plant, for example. What we're going to go through here is a simple example, but just keep in mind there could be quite a lot of divergence from the diagram that I'm showing here. Right? And what we have here is a water treatment tank. So contaminated water comes up from the left pipe and then goes out the right pipe. You see two sensors attached to the right side of that, that, of that tank. So what happens here is when the water is below the lower sensor, the right valve closes and the left pump starts pumping, water, uh, pumping in dirty water. And when the water is reached higher than that higher sensor, the left pump stops 
And after an hour, the right valve opens up and drains the tank. So you know, after an hour of, of treating that water and cleaning that water, it gets drained out. The pumps and the valves are what are known as actuators in the OT world. Out in the field, you might even find actuators, um, you might find sensors and actuators that are integrated into a single device. Again, there's a lot of variety in OT environments, but just be aware that they are very different functions. One serves as an input, sensors serves as an input into the OT system, whereas actuators serve as output from the OT system. The brains of the operations is a PLC, Programmable Logic Controller. And again, there's a lot of variety here in OT environments. So in an, in an electrical plant, you might have an IED instead of PLC. IED standing for Intelligent Electronic Device, or Electrical Device. And an HMI is a panel that a technician uses to adjust the behavior of the system through the PLC. So think of like a thermostat in your house, that sort of locked down functionality. It's not a full computer, just locked down functionality where you're pushing buttons. Something that a technician would use. PLCs are programmed with an engineer's workstation. This is an actual PC, so an IT device in the OT environment, and it's often running an older version of Windows, even Windows XP. Right? So this is one system, and at a particular site, you may have multiple of these systems all collaborating with each other in what is known as a DCS, a distributed control system. Or on the other hand, you might have these systems, multiple of these systems, spread out over a large geographic area, organized into what is known as a SCADA, supervisory control and data access. Now if you do have a SCADA, you might have what is known as an RTU that allows you to relay between a PLC and some sort of centralized control center back at headquarters. So this is a quick tour of how a small part of an OT environment might look like. You know, basically, we just went over the, the terminology. So now let's look, have a look and see how OT environments differ from, differ from IT environments in terms of security. In IT, we are concerned about the move, movement of data or restricting the movement of data. In OT, it's about moving widgets and gears. In IT, uh, IT device vendors, they produce products with planned obsolescence. They expect you to replace your computers and your tablets every three to five years, but OT devices tend to be deployed and remain for a much, much, much longer time. Conventional wisdom in our industry says that the three pillars of concern for security are confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and arguably, personal opinion here, uh, with IT environments, confidentiality tends to be more important. So if you think about it, an e-commerce site, if it goes down, it's unavailable, the company might lose money, but they're not getting sued. On the other hand, if this e-commerce company loses customer PII, they're gonna get sued, right? So confidentiality is relatively more important, in my opinion. Now, on the OT side, availability is absolutely the most important thing, right? And there's a couple of reasons for this. Let's say this is a commercial organization, oil refinery. Every minute that the plant is down, they are losing money. So their interest in availability is based on the impact of the business in, material, in, in, in real dollars. Also, many of these critical infrastructures can face fines for an outage. So when Colonial Pipeline was hacked and they were not able to move gas around, or natural gas, yeah, uh, they were fined by FISMA for $1 million for an outage. It wasn't their fault. Or, well, <laughs> maybe it was their fault, but they got hacked, right? Um, and they were fine because of the outage. So availability is so much more important uh, for commercial organizations for that reason. Now, if this is a government or organization or a quasi-governmental organization, like a municipal water treatment facility, there are politicians in power who want to avoid the bad press of having an outage. So depending on the type of organization, there is concern for availability, but at the end of the day, that is the most important concern in OT security, more so than confidentiality. Nearly all IT devices have one of these operating systems, which are all time-sharing operating systems. In OT, you find a lot of real-time operating systems instead, and there are so many more of them. OT devices are programmed with languages like ladder diagram, functional block diagram, and, and so on and so forth. 
and OT devices are almost never updated or patched. Go back to the idea of availability. These organizations do not want to shut down these devices for any reason. They don't want to shut down for updates or patches, and they definitely don't want, they definitely want to avoid the possibility of a longer outage because of an update going bad. Now, here I say IT is secure by design, and some of you might, might laugh at that, and I, I don't totally disagree with you, but when compared to OT, IT devices are secure by design. With OT field devices, actuators and sensors, there's just absolutely nothing, there's zero. The moment you have access to a PLC, you own those field devices. Another concern here is that OT traffic is almost never encrypted, so traffic interception and modification, person in the middle, that is totally a thing with OT. Many OT devices do not require authentication even. And even if they do, there's usually no governance around remediating default passwords, default users, default, default settings, and so on and so forth. So basically, once you get access to the PLC, you own it. You own all the field devices that are attached to it. IT devices these days tend to have endpoint protection, EDR, host-based firewalls, or they're being scanned by a Vuln scanner. In OT, some of the industries have started introducing uh, endpoint controls, security controls, but in many of the industries, there's just nothing whatsoever. Traditionally, IT devices are the ones that are somehow connected to the internet, right? Through your cable, through your wireless, somehow connected to the internet. But OT devices were kept physically separate. And this sort of explains why people thought it was okay to not have endpoint protection and to not have authentication and, and how like um, for, for traffic to be unencrypted and so on and so forth. Because in order to compromise an OT device, you had to walk up to it. Traditionally, OT networks had their own protocols. But starting around 2005, you started seeing more and more of these OT networks to get getting overlaid on top of IP networks, thereby reachable from the internet. So you have a whole history of lack of security in OT, and it was OK because everything was air-gapped at one point, but starting 2005, that sort of protection of isolation just sort of went away. And we have a new reality to deal with. What you're looking at here is called the Purdue model. And it shows an ideal model of what an OT network should look like, where there are different levels of risk and controls that are stratified for the sake of security. You'll see here that sensors and actuators, sensors and actuators are down at the bottom in level zero, PLCs, also known as field controllers over there, are in level one, and you see HMIs in layers three, two and three. In Purdue, each layer is only supposed to communicate, or devices in each layer is supposed to only communicate with devices in the adjacent layer. You're not supposed to be able to go from one to three. You go from one to two, one to zero. You don't go one to three, one to four. Between each layer, there's supposed to be one of two things. One, Physical separation, air gapping, which is good, but keep in mind, Stuxnet was a very good example of how an attacker was able to bridge that air gap through a USB key. So not foolproof. The second one here is some sort of network security control that adjudicates access between layers or um, communication going across boundaries. That could be a firewall, it could be an IPS, or, or what have you. In reality, though, very few organizations ever fully achieve Purdue. In fact, notice how, um, in fact, if you were able to infiltrate the higher layers of Purdue, a secondary attack into the lower layers is shockingly easily. Notice how in the upper layers, it's very IT-ish, right? We're looking at, you know, web service and so on, so things that we would see in IT while the lower layers are more, uh, more OT. Compromising devices gets easier and easier as you move down this stack. So basically, once you get in from the top, if you can infiltrate to the top, it's pretty much a no-brainer for you to get to the bottom. And once you do, you move swiftly to layer one, to the PLC, and then you have access to the crown jewels in layer zero. 
Sounds easy, right? What if I told you it's often easier than that? Wouldn't it be easier if you could just skip through all those top layers and go right to layer one over the internet? Well, the answer is yes, it would be a lot easier, of course. Remember, no organization truly implements Purdue. Some organizations are very far from Purdue, and as you can see in this example, this is layer one. There's a PLC directly connected to the internet. You can skip through layer six through two, go right to layer one. And once you get to layer one, you own layer zero, right? I didn't even have to log into Shodan for this search result. But why bother with Shodan? Why not just Google for the, with the proper dorks? These days, PLCs have web interfaces for, for remote management. Why don't you just log in? So you might be wondering, well, what's the username and password? Remember what I said earlier? PLCs have default users, default passwords, default settings. And there's no governance around changing that or mitigating that. So it's all there. Here's a CSV of usernames and passwords from SCADA Strangelove. They're an independent group of InfoSec researchers focused on ICS and SCADA systems. And they just publish it all out there for you for those default usernames and passwords. All right, so now you're, maybe you're wondering, okay, what if this PLC does not have a default password? Then what do I do? Remember what I said earlier about how OT devices are never updated or patched? Just head on over to CISA and search for a Vuln to exploit. Right, more than likely, that Vuln's not been patched. So now you might be thinking, well, OT devices are so different from IT devices. Would I need a different set of tools to exploit this Vuln? The answer is no. Just go with your current tooling. Metasploit has modules for exploiting Vulns in OT devices as well. I think at this point, some of you might be thinking, I should really think, uh, rethink my plan to go off the grid, <laughs> or at least be prepared. Uh, but I I, I'm hoping to also impress upon all of you that there's a problem with our critical infrastructure and key, re key resources. Any organization that has an OT environment needs to have a hard look at it. I was being very cynical earlier when I said that organizations are, are focused on availability because you know, they care about making money or their reputation, but that in no way discounts the importance of availability. So much of our lives depends on a steady flow of electricity, of gasoline, of pharmaceuticals, and clean water. It behooves every security organization to dig into their OT environments if they have one. Now, arguably, getting a full inventory of all of your OT devices is the first step in making sense of all of this. So how do we find out about all of our OT devices? Some organizations in the past have tried scanning OT environments with active scanners like Nmap, Nessus, Qualys, and these usually resulted in mass outages and financial losses, which are not reported. So for this reason, security teams usually use a passive network monitor to listen for traffic on switches, uh, for span traffic from switches or, or by a tap, which is okay as long as you're able to access the necessary choke points to see all the traffic. But let's take a look at this more, more closely. Suppose you have this SCADA system over here where obviously you have multiple sites and any sort of site-to-site -site communication is backhauled through the headquarters. Well, in this case, all of your core and distribution switches are in the headquarters, so at least you can see all the traffic from the devices that are talking outside of their own individual sites. Now consider this scenario where all the site-to-site -site communication is not backhauled through the control center. Well, this is obviously operationally more efficient, right? better for the business but it also makes it much harder to set up a passive network monitor. If you have hundreds of sites, it's gonna be impossible to get a full asset inventory. There's no way you're going to be able to configure that many switches and those many sites to gather all the traffic that you need to get a full view of all the OT devices within this SCADA. So by sticking with a passive network monitor solution, instead of active scanning, security teams are inviting a lot of these issues. Passive network monitors are very hard to deploy. Connecting to spam ports or taps at enough choke points is difficult to get done. Passive network monitors 
collect a, collect a lot of data. So you, get to, so you tend to get really poor performance unless you have some really high-powered high, high um, hardware appliance. So as you can imagine, they're also going to be very expensive. And what you get for your money and your effort is not a full asset inventory. The details that you have on those devices are minimal. And the fingerprinting can often be wrong because you're only fingerprinting based on what you see on the network, what's on the wire. So let's dig into the reasons why active OT scanning has failed in the past, right? Why there was, were those, all those outages. And the reasons why are also the basis for the five principles for active OT scanning. Scanners like MMAP and Nessus use intentionally non-standard packets or unexpected payloads for fingerprinting. So have a look here at packet 2053. This is what is known as a Christmas packet. Notice how the thin, the thin bit, the push bit, and the urgent bit are all set to true. This is not a standard packet. Nobody sends this unless you are some sort of volunt scanner or um, a network scanner. And depending on the network stack of the device that's being, uh, being scanned, it might handle this. But what is often the case with OT devices is they crash, or they reboot, or they freeze up. And the same is true higher up in the stack with the application payloads as well. Programming for IT has had decades of innovation in the way we engineer our software, release our software, test our software. Handling arbitrary input coming over the network through input checking or balance checking is very standard practice these days for IT applications. For OT applications, the code was written to respond to somebody pressing a button, not arbitrary, strange input coming over the network. So unexpected payloads can also lead to reboots and freezes. The second one here, vulnerability scanners send security probes to detect vulnerabilities. By its very nature, it is sending unexpected traffic. That's what it does. And for the same reasons as the previous slides, OT devices may, erect, may react erratically. Legacy vuln scanners and network scanners can send large amounts of traffic to endpoints in a short amount of time. OT equipment may not have the processing power to handle heavy scan traffic, which causes it to slow down or freeze as well. Now, sometimes it's not just the endpoints, but also the networking devices that can't handle the scan traffic. So in this example, we have a pipeline in the, in the middle of nowhere, some rural location, where you can't get fiber and you can't DS, get DSL. The best you can do is a phone line with a modem. Now, imagine there's another site with a pump in an even more, relo more remote location. You can't even get a phone line. So what they do in that case is they set up radios for the, the pump to communicate back to the, the pipe and then piggyback over the phone line to get back to headquarters. This is not the type of network that can handle a lot of scan traffic, right? Plain and simple. The solution is to make sure that you are tuning your scanner in at least two ways. First is by dialing down the number of total packets per second from your scanner. And the second one is to spread out that scan traffic as much as you can across multiple devices. So rather than hitting each device sequentially with a ton of packets, instead you're actively scanning multiple devices at once, but with less traffic to each device at any given time. The fourth principle here. There are some devices where even standards compliant traffic can crash them. And to handle these, it's really important to avoid the type of fingerprinting that you might find with MMAP or SYNFP where you're basically just trying to capture all the information at once and doing fingerprinting on that. Rather, what you want to do is start out with some really super benign query for the device, get some idea of what that thing is, could be, and then you iteratively follow up with more in-depth queries when you know it's safe to proceed. And the last principle here is to go slow, start small, until you can scan larger and larger parts of your OT environment until you're getting at everything. All right, so we're going to move on to IoT here. 
So one major problem with IoT scanning is that they tend to have, these IoT devices tend to have very few listening ports, and they tend to be encrypted. So when you all, all you see is an SSH port and an HTTPS port, it's pretty tough to figure out what that thing is, right? And so for that reason, naive scanners often identify IoT devices as Linux machines. Can't tell the difference. It can't tell you if that's, that's truly a coffee mug or if it's, if it's an uh, IP camera instead. It all looks like Linux. If you start digging a little bit deeper, right, maybe looking at MAC addresses, you might be able to see the IoT platform that the device was built on, right? Uh, Raspberry Pi or Espressif, these are two common IoT platforms. But you're still not really getting a really good sense of, of what that thing is. Fingerprinting IoT often involves this painstaking process of looking into the payload to find model-specific information that tells you what the thing is. And oftentimes, this means contact contacting the device via HTTPS, parsing the payload, and looking for telltale signs that give you some sort of indication. Aside from being really hard to fingerprint, many IoT devices are also prone to disruption, just like uh, OT. I mean, they're coded, just like OT devices, they're coded to respond to somebody pressing a button, right? Not arbitrary traffic coming over the network. And again, like OT devices, um, these, some of these devices, some of these IoT devices will behave strangely even with standards compliant traffic, right? Um, examples of this include serial to Ethernet adapters or, or print servers. In fact, <laughs> um, there are some printers out there where if you send a certain, uh, tra certain characters over a port 9001, it starts spewing paper out of, uh, of, of, of the printer. It doesn't print anything, but it just starts spewing paper, spewing paper until like, you run out of paper. So you might be thinking, well, maybe this isn't such a big deal, right? Disrupting the, your network-enabled coffee mug just means you get a bad, bad cup of coffee, right? So who cares? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that many of these OT devices are definitely valid attack vectors into our homes and our businesses with real, real impact to, to privacy, right? And it's no surprise that many of these, of these devices are restricted under the National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act, Section 889, right? Uh, Chinese devices, if you will. And they're, they're very much a real threat. So, and I, I, I personally know of one organization that found an IoT camera that was making a network connection uh, to an IP address in China, even though that organization did no business with anybody in China. And I'm sure there are plenty of instances of that. You know, this is just the one that I know about. So it's important to get out there and know what is on your network. And the good news is the same five principles that we discussed for OT also work for IoT. I have time for one question, <laughs> if anybody has. Yes, please. The question is, how seriously are uh, owners of SCADA systems taking um, security, right? Do, do they think security is important? It depends, it depends on the organization. Some more mature private organizations where, um, where either they've already been hacked or um, there's, there's do real dollars that, that matter, they, they are taking steps towards it, but uh, for many organizations, not at all. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that many of our public organizations, governmental organizations, are not really on the ball in terms of that. Yeah, it is scary. Yep. Things things are changing, obviously, but you know it's it's not where you want it to be, not where you want it to be. All right, so I'm going to leave with you all with a parting thought here. There was a time where you wouldn't do any of these things, but now you get into Ubers, you might have a Tesla that drives itself, you may have bought crypto, and and you all work from home at some point. So maybe it's time to consider actively scanning your OT environments. If you want to contact with me or connect with me, this is how you can do it. Thank you, everybody.